Well, good morning. It's uh, Sunday morning here on uh, 153 Great Fish dot website. It is March 6th. It is 8.30 a.m. We have an interesting study today, and uh, so I hope you've got your pen and paper and your cup of coffee. So let's get started by opening in prayer. Jesus, we love you, Lord. We praise you, God. We ask you to be part of our study, to anoint us. God, help us to learn what we need to learn from the examples in the Old Testament. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Can you... Uh, Follow along with me in the PowerPoint here just for a second. This is the uh, Foundations Bible Study that we are, we are going through. It's a course. It lasts 13 weeks. We are in week 8. The title of today's lesson is The People Want a King. The People Want a King. And nothing has really changed. Here's the uh, outline of the course. You can stop the video here and go through that and go to lesson 1. It will describe what the objectives of the course are. And uh, here's today's outline. The People Want a King. Here's the outline. We're going to give a chronology of the post-Joshua era. We're going to talk about how disobedience leads to oppression. There are six major and minor judges during this period, this 300-year period. Uh, the prophet Samuel is the last judge. We're going to talk about the corruption that occurred to the priesthood and the weakness of the nepotism leadership model. All right. So here we go. Here's the outline. Uh, Joshua dies in approximately 1318 B.C. Syncretism takes hold. The first oppression is fought by Caleb's brother, Othniel. Uh, recall Caleb was the one who had the, uh, was challenged as one of the good spies. He came back with a positive report, and they conquered Jerusalem, his brother and him, and they were giving a primo uh, location in the Holy Land. The last judge, Samuel, emerged and anointed Israel's first king, Saul, but he remained judge until he anointed David king in uh, 1003 B.C., then he dies. So that's the 300-year period, 1303 to 1003. So there were 300 years of disobedience and oppression, oppressing nations and the uh, major judges. That's what I'm going to talk about here. Now, there were 12 judges, but I'm only going to talk about the six. Now, they're called major judges because of the length of their story. First of all, they were oppressed by the Edomites, that's Esau's family, Othniel. Caleb's little brother becomes the judge that delivers, Judges 3-9. Uh, then they were oppressed by the Moabites, that's Lot's family, and they were uh, the judges Ehud, he's the left-handed man. You can read about him in Judges 3-15. Then the Canaanites, a judge uh, was uh, chosen not because of their sex, so here's Deborah and Barak. Deborah is the judge. This is found in Judges 4, 4 through 9. The Midianites, and of course this is the story of Gideon, Judges 6, 7 through 8. The Ammonites, Lot's family, Jephthah, the castaway, the cast out in Judges 11 uh, through 12 through 7, very long story. And of course the Philistines, the longest story uh, in uh, the judge, judges period. Samson, of course, is the judge during that period. So let's talk about what is a judge, okay? What are they? So these 12 judges came from a marginal social class. Their leadership was temporary. It always arose during a crisis. Now, after they would go through this process of being oppressed, they would cry out to God, and God would raise up a judge. And division, of course, was always the reason for their weakness. So we see that there's a relationship between syncretism or infidelity and division. So God was the king over Israel during this time, but he's only king during the times of piety. So he removes his hand and permits oppression when people become disobedient. Now these judges were charismatic because we know that because this phrase was always said about them, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and that tells us they were charismatic uh, leaders. They, they delivered either a, a tribe, a region, or a nation. And, and the other thing is to uh, keep in mind is that sometimes these judges rose up simultaneously in different regions of the country. The country was would fall into division and have oppression from different areas. Uh, sometimes, if you read your Bible sort of sequentially, you can get into trouble. So, uh, or think of, of the timeline as sequential, I guess is what I mean. So the, uh, there were parallel events happening here during this time. They had symptoms of in infidelity. For example, Gideon had infidelity in his life. He had an alternate name, Jerubabel, which means Baal will strive. And uh, we know that he, uh, uh, his father constructed an altar to Baal. And that uh, syncretism even infected the, uh, the judges and the priesthood. So in the city of Shechem, where uh, Gideon was from, the people continued to worship Baal Barit, which means Baal the covenant. The word Barit means covenant. 
after uh, Gideon dies. So, as I said, a major judge has a longer story than a minor judge, not necessarily a longer time, but the Bible gives a longer story, and that's why we focus on the six. And they always arose from that pattern that came out of infidelity or secretism, which was disobedience, oppression, repentance, or they cried out, and then deliverance. So, here's the prophecy of Joshua's angel. I don't know if you know that Joshua's angel gave a prophecy to the country, and here it is, found in Joshua 2, 1 through 5. It says, And an angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal, which means circumcision, to Bakim, weeping, and said, I made you to go out of Egypt. I have brought you into the land which I swear unto your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. But I ask you not to make no league with the inhabitants of this land. You shall throw down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? That's a good question. What is in man? You know, the Bible says the heart is deceitful and wicked. What is it about people when they put a relationship above obedience to God? And that's really the question here. They put a relationship with the Canaanites, the Philistines, the, these people from other lands, because they wanted to be good people, okay? A cultural value, not God's value. God wants obedience to his word, not the social values that we create. This is what God says, Wherefore, I also said, I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be as thorns in your sides, and their God shall be a snare unto you. And then the children of Israel wept, they lifted up their voice, and of course they called the place Bochim, which means the place of weeping. So there's the prophecy that they would fall into infidelity. They would put people and uh, the human definition of goodness over God's definition of holiness. And then, of course, we know that this period was a period of transition. So they exist during this transition phase, and he leads, God is king, through a distributed democracy. So unity comes through faithfulness to the Word of God. And, of course, God becomes king when we are faithful to that Word. And it's the same way in the church today. And so these things happen uh, to Israel because God is trying to give us some lessons on how to behave in the church. So four times during this period, the people lament, and they say, there is no king in Israel. And there's the scriptures you can read them for yourself. So they want a king like the Canaanites have. They want to see somebody they, so they can worship them. That's what they want. They want somebody else to fight their battles. They don't want to live by faith. They want to live by having somebody rule over them. Let somebody else work out my salvation for me. Even though I'm going to go to the judgment seat alone, I want my pastor to go to the judgment seat for me. I want a king I can see. And, of course, we see a lot of worship of pastors today because people have the same problem. They want a king in their life. Listen, there's only one king. His name is Jesus. And anybody who takes his place... Your pastor is not Jesus Christ. He is a judge, a leader. But if he's not living right, don't follow him. That doesn't mean you should cause division. It means you shouldn't follow him. Paul said, follow me as I follow after Christ. <clears throat> now notice the last verse <clears throat> in the book of Judges. This is what it says. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did that, <clears throat> that which was right in his own eyes. Interesting, isn't it? That's exactly uh, how God wants to reign, with the exception of every man should do what is right in God's eyes, <laughs> not his own eyes. And that was the problem. And so we can see what the, the transitional period was really all about well, the, uh, in the first uh, seven chapters of Samuel, which immediately follows the book of, of Judges. The ark becomes prominent. It circulates among the people. It rests in Shiloh. This is the Bronze Age. So think of the Judges as a period of transition. So, the story of, of this period is that corruption, nepotism, um, idolatry, uh, and uh, syncretism all make the people divided, they become weak, and they become oppressed. So, we have Eli the high priest. He has two undisciplined, this, you'll read about this in 1 Samuel. He has two undisciplined sons who are in the priesthood. They oppress the worshipers through prosperity gospel. They are conquering the laity. They are turning themselves into God, telling them this is the right way to do it, when the law was completely opposite of what they were supposed to do. They were taking all of God's sacrifices and consuming it upon their own lusts. There is no prosperity gospel. There is no king in the church. There is only one king. His name is Jesus. Can you say amen? The word of God was precious in those days. In other words, the gift of prophecy did not operate. Now, there's a parallel in today's church world. Is the gift of prophecy operating? I'm not talking about tongues and interpretation. I'm talking about foretelling. Is it operating? 
I'm talking about a true prophetic event in the church world. It operated in the first church. Why is it precious today? The lamp of God went out. We see many churches have no spirit in them at all. Okay? They forbid speaking in tongues. They forbid uh, gifts of the spirit. Okay? The lamp went out. The boy Samuel was called and prophesied Eli's judgment because he was no longer a faithful priest. Now, we, we see a parallel story in uh, the book of Revelation, the church of Thyatira. We see that God commands these people to stay in this church, which has divided leadership. Some of the leaders are corrupt and some are not. Some are, 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 infidel, are bringing infidelity into the body by mixing philosophy or other religions in with Christianity. But God tells the people at Thyatira, stay in that church, don't leave. I know your names, I know you're being faithful. You be faithful even though these leaders are not faithful. And basically that was the story of Samuel. He was faithful and, and he was asked to tell Eli what Eli, or to tell Eli what Eli's judgment would be. He first refuses because he's young and Eli is old and, and he's the leader and uh, he's the anointed. Now Samuel never takes God's judgment, puts it in his own hands. God always executes his own judgment. And that's the story of Thyatira. God will take care of things. God took care of Eli and his sons, including his posterity and his wife. They all died. God judged them, but the people became impatient and wanted to judge them for themselves, so they began to ask Samuel for a king, because Samuel's sons were corrupt too. They, they, they thought, well, my, my dad's the boss, so I'm the boss too, and I'm going to do what I want to do. And uh, We see this pattern repeated in the church world, is that you cannot put anybody, including your own children, over the Word of God and how God wants things done. And we see people wanting to take matters in their own hands as rebellion. You don't do that. You leave it up to God. You speak peace to all men. You follow peace with all men. And uh, uh, what you do is you put these things in God's hands and you wait for Him to take care of them. So God relents, permits them a king according to the Canaanite model. What was that model? They wanted somebody they could see, tall, dark, handsome, wearing a Rolex watch, driving a Lexus. Has anything changed today? That's the kind of president people want in the United States. Somebody who's rich, wealthy, a billionaire, or uh, uh, somebody who has a cause. That's the way that men choose. They choose with their eyes. But God looks on the heart. So God permitted them to have a king the way that they wanted. One like the Canaanite nation's hand. He gives them Saul. So he's from the tribe of Benjamin. There, there's, a, there's a reason why he's from the tribe of Benjamin, and we're going to go on to that. So then the ark is stolen because it is the symbol of unity. When they would circulate the ark through the uh, tribes of Israel, it would create unity, and they, they felt like it, it was the, the symbol that, of God's power. But the problem was God's power was only there as long as the people lived holy. And of course, the ark was stolen by the Philistines. God then judges Eli's house. Read the story of the church of Thyatira. Understand this is a similarity. This is a parallel here for the church world. So, nepotism can not work when you don't discipline your sons. Themes, so here's the themes of this period. Samson's weakness for foreign women. He, uh, he chases them, okay? And he chases Philistine girls, and his parents told him, you need to marry a girl from our own nation. So if infidelity leads to assimilation. Uh, should a Christian marry a non-Christian? The answer is no, don't do it. <laughs> How do you know whether you'll save them or not? Paul gives specific instruction in 1 Corinthians 7 about this. Then we have this priest, this Levitical priest, Micah. He's a hireling, and he creates and, and constructs an idolatrous shrine with, uh, with uh, uh, you know, teraphim, the uh, small idols of, of the uh, nations to the north. Then there are two civil wars of disunity, one in Ephraim in Judges 12.7, and then, of course, the story of Benjamin. This is where the sodomites of Benjamin want to take uh, a priest, a Levite, and they, uh, it's similar to the story of Sodom. They knock on the door, they want them, and they push out the Levite's concubine, the abuser, and then, of course, the Levite uh, then cuts her body into pieces. She's dead, sends it to all Israel. All of Israel comes and destroys Benjamin. Notice that Saul is a leftover from the tribe of Benjamin. Uh, you know, there, there's, there's a reason for all this. So then we go on to Gideon's son, Abimelech. He tries to become king. This brought disaster, total disaster. He was oppressive. He, uh, uh, and that, that's the thing, that, that there, anybody who wants to be a king and become infallible begins to oppress people. They become his assets. Uh, they become his. They don't belong to the Lord. They, they belong to him. 
And that is oppression. That brings disaster. There are no kings in the church. So Hannah, uh, Samuel's mother, is a type of uh, Mary. She raises a, uh, a faithful leader. And of course, we see that the parallel of Samuel versus Eli, the corrupt priest, is a foreshadowing of Jesus versus uh, the Pharisees. All right, so here are the church lessons. We see that these tribes, etc., are living in a period of, of uh, God's the king in some sort of a uh, uh, distributed uh, democracy, but it's a, really a theocracy. And uh, God warns them, of course, about getting a king. But we see that the Ark of the Covenant, it circulates. Samuel has a circuit, and this keeps the people unified. Now, the Levites were supposed to keep the people unified, and, and uh, they were to bring their unified worship. There was only supposed to be one, one altar, and that was in Shiloh at this time, where God had placed his name. But let's look what happens uh, during the life of Samuel. Uh, the tabernacle remains at Shiloh during his birth and consecration. The Philistines uh, uh, bring the crisis to the west. <clears throat> the story of Samuel and Saul happens. The st uh, story of Samuel and David. And so <clears throat> we see that there are anti-kingship passages in 1 Samuel 8, 10, and 12. But then we also see that there are pro-kingship passages in chapters 9 and 11. The people want a visible king. And that's what happens in the uh, book of 1 Samuel. So this is the scripture. And uh, the Lord tells Samuel, He did demand the people and everything they say to you, for it is not you they have rejected, it is me. They have rejected me as their king. He did demand, but warn them solemnly and tell them about the practices of any king who will rule over them. God is warning them about being oppressed because men cannot be kings in the state that we are in. We do not have the fullness of the Spirit of Christ. That's why men cannot rule. So, uh, it, it seems like uh, uh, good kings are always bad people. They always end up in oppression because it, uh, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Men cannot handle that kind of power over others. And that's why we need to have Jesus as our king only. Only Jesus is my king, but people want a Caesar. They want somebody they can see. And uh, God tells them, okay, give them what they want, and we'll, we'll give them the kind of king that they want. So Samuel warns them, the day will come when you cry out because of the king whom you have chosen. The Lord will not answer you in that day. Samuel himself was hurt that they had rejected not only his judgeship, but they had rejected God's model of ruling the country. And they replied, no, we must have a king over us that we may be like all the other nations. Somebody we can see, somebody we can worship. We don't want to worship an invisible God. Let our king rule over us and go out at our head and fight our battles. Well, that's the, uh, I guess, that's, <laughs> that's the, uh, the uh, topic uh, today. And you can see uh, not much has changed among people. And these things were written for our admonition that uh, we could uh, understand that God wants to lead us through the Spirit, through the Holy Spirit. That's Jesus Christ in us. There are are no kings and fallible popes in our churches. Anyone who acts that way, the model of Thyatira, the model of Eli is, just ignore them, continue to worship, because you have to fellowship, and just let bad people be bad people. God will take care of it if you will pray and be faithful. If you don't follow them as they don't follow Christ, keep your mouth shut, don't create division, just let God take care of it. And I think that's the, the big lesson of this period of syncretism. And, and the reason that a kingship emerges in, in the church and somebody becomes infallible is because of syncretism, idolatry. They have mixed the ways of the world, the Harvard business model. You'll hear a lot of uh, uh, Harvard business things uh, coming into the church about how to run a business or how to market and all these things that are from philosophy, human philosophy. It's not after Christ. And... Uh, uh, People will rule that way because they see it in the popular press. They read a book uh, from a popular author, Stephen Covey or somebody like that, and all of a sudden there's raving fans in the church. And You know, it's hogwash. It's not the way that God does things. God uh, is looking for a biblical leadership model, but he's also looking for uh, biblical people that will follow him, Jesus Christ. He's the head of the church. Okay, The head of every man is Jesus Christ. Okay, that's what it says in, in 1 Corinthians uh, 11. And uh, we need to take that and uh, make that our, our uh, core of, of, of the oneness of God, that He is sovereign over each of us. Okay, I hope you enjoyed the lesson today. Um, I hope nobody's offended. Uh, this was uh, intended to help people to 
bring the, uh, the anointing and the power of God and the unity that God desires to put in the church. God bless you in Jesus' name.